Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of A Decent Ride by Irvin Welsh. So, Irvin Welsh is a Scottish author. Uh, he's the author of Train Spotting, uh, which is obviously a I think that one's a lot darker than this one. This one um, has actually been shortlisted for like comedy writing awards. It does have a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll in it, but it's not as harrowing as Train Spotting. It's a lot more just generally amusing. So uh, this is Juice Terry Lawson book number three. I'm going to read you the blurb, then we're going to go through and check out my tabs and uh, share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I know that Susie's been looking forward to this one because as I was reading it, I kept on coming in from like going out for a cigarette and reading a bit, and I'd come in and be like, "You'll never guess what Juice Terry Lawson's done now." So here we go. A rampaging force of nature is wreaking havoc on the streets of Edinburgh. But has top shagger, drug dealer, gonzo porn star and taxi driver Juice Terry Lawson finally met his match in Hurricane Borbag? Can Terry discover the fate of the missing beauty, Jinty Magdalene, and keep her idiot savant lover, the man-child wee Jonty, out of prison? Will he find out the real motives of unscrupulous American businessman and reality TV star Ronald Checker? And crucially, will Terry be able to negotiate life after a terrible event robs him of his sexual virility? And can a new fascination for the game of golf help him to live without a decent ride? A decent ride sees Irvin Welsh back on home turf, leaving us in the capable hands of one of his most compelling and popular characters, Juice Terry Lawson, and introducing another bound for cult status, Wee Jonty Mackay, a man with the genitals and brain of a donkey. In his funniest, filthiest book yet, Irvin Welsh celebrates an unreconstructed misogynist hustler, a central character who is shameless but also oddly decent, and finds new ways of making wild comedy out of fantastically dark material, taking on some of the last taboos. So fasten your seatbelts because this is one ride that could certainly get a little bumpy. And uh, we kick off with a quote here, Aldous Huxley, an intellectual is someone who's found one thing that's more interesting than sex. And uh, that is a bit of a precursor to uh, Terry becoming a bit of a bit of a, an intellectual. So here we get introduced to Ronald Checker, who's quite an important character. Uh, Ronald Checker is not used to being unrecognised. An influential property developer, he is also a reality TV star, known widely for his successful show The Prodigal. The scion of a wealthy Atlanta family, the Harvard graduate had followed his father's footsteps into real estate. Ron Checker and his father had never been close, this fact making him utterly mercenary at utilising the old man's extensive contacts. Thus son became more successful than father, breaking out of America's Sunbelt states to go global. Ron decided that he would pitch a TV show to the networks, positing himself as a southern, youthful, punkish version of Donald Trump, who had enjoyed success with The Apprentice. A designer friend gave him the mohawk look, and a researcher at the network coined his catchphrase, business takes balls. Now The Prodigal is a third season globally syndicated show and Checker knows it screens in the UK. Uneasily, he asked the cabbie, have you ever seen The Prodigal? No live, but I ken what you're talking boot, Terry nods. Sorry about, my uh, sorry about my Scottish accent, by the way. That smack my bitch up was controversial, aye, but there's some birds that like that. A bit of refaction, if you can what I mean. Know that I'm sexist or an out like that. To me, it's ladies' prerogative. They demand you supply. It's what gentlemen do, but I mate. Checker is finding it difficult to understand this cabbie. All he can do is respond with a gruff, yes. Yeah, you, you kind of need to understand phonetic Scots, I guess, to be able to read these. So uh, here we have uh, chapter two, guarantee. So uh, this is from uh, Terry's point of view and it's written in this Scottish phonetic thing. I like staying in Oxford Street, cause you've got it all here in the south side. Quiet street, close to the tune for office minge. Near the university for young student fanny, and in a nice wee spot to take lassies for this scheme. Now too fancy, just a tidy wee front room with a big L-shaped settee. A bedroom we are king sized, and a wee kitchen with all that protein shake stuff. I live on the cunts, me. I don't keep much furniture in the pad. I like to call it minimalist in design concept. I've got a bootcase with some books wrapped barrel lens eyes, which I never fucking read, but I keep to impress the student birds. Moby Dick, Crime and Punishment, that sort of shite. That Dostoevsky cunt. I tried to read them, but every fucker had a boot five different names, and I left the scheme to get away from all that. Too fucking right. My Scots accent is not as bad as I thought it was actually gonna be. So here's Terry thinking about his kids. So I'm thinking about lasses, and two in particular, Suzanne Prince and Yvette Burson. The two I fired into bareback that weekend nearly ten years ago when I was on a downer after the third divorce. As a result, I got two wee bastards out of the deal. But I'm all for Gillum and the ginger bastard keeping them our surnames. Feminism, but I. 
Mind you, if it had been up to me, I'd have had that fucking tube of Bather Snatches and been sucking like a double team in Colton Hill Bufty till I tasted Clara, then spat Bather bloody bastards into the lavy pan. But they wanted to keep them high, so they're here. And I have no complaints, just as long as the name Lawson's kept off the certificates. Too fucking true. All right, so here's Juice Terry talking a little bit about uh, Guillaume. So he goes, then there's we Guillaume. Susan was convinced that it was this French waiters at first. She'd banged the cunt the night before me, but no fucking chance of that. The amount of spunk that comes out of they hee-haws isn't it fucking real. Spunk, ya cunt. If she'd stood up with her legs apart or a bucket after, I could have wallpapered a fucking hoose. But we spunk out this quality, you got to fucking guard it, because birds want a barn with personality. Being a man fay the bareback here and having their instincts, you got to be double wide, make sure a lassie's on the bun. But with that AIDS and STD, there's loads that'll insist on a Johnny. Fucking passion killers at the best of times, and when you've got a welt like mine, it can take ages to get one of these things ruined it. To me, it's like destroying the gains made by the pill and the sexual revolution. The fucking government's fault. If all they buffy public school cunts hadn't been been riding each other, there would be no fucking AIDS and STDs in the first place. Alright, so here's Terry with his kids, with the casual homophobia. Use the brothers, well, half-brothers, and yous might love each other. But in a different way to say how a man loves a woman, right? Yes, both not at once, and thank fuck, that's a relief. No one in a buffy son, especially the wee Ridian. Cunt's gonna get it tight enough through being a ginger bastard. So here we have what's his name, um, the American Ronald Checker. So this is from his point of view. He's having a he's having a wee prayer. Gracious Lord, Eternal Saviour, I am so, so sorry, for I know I have sinned against your profligate wastrels. Lord, I accept that in your infinite wisdom you saw fit to create those beings too, just as you did the cockroach and housefly. As your servant, it is not for me to question your unfathomable mysteries, but my comments in Time magazine about those unfortunate Negroes were twisted and taken out of context by the liberal media. I was asked a question about government spending, and I simply said that the citizens of New Orleans were feeling your wrath. And that President George Bush was correct to butt out of this one and let your judgement hold sway. Was that not the right thing to say? I now worry that perhaps I've wronged you, and now you've brought this hurricane here to Scotland to punish me for my mortal folly and daring to interpret your mysterious ways. Spare me, Lord. So here we see um, a little bit of wee John T, who's a uh, bit of a simple chap. So um, he's gone out for a walk and we get... In the McDonald's at the junction of Georgie Road and Westfield Road, small groups of obese adults and children sit alongside the stick thin, who seem immune to the high fat and calorific onslaught of the outlet's offerings. The thinnest of them all, wee Jaunty Mackay, enters and looks open mouthed at the menu board, then glances at two women diners, as plump as Christmas turkeys in their Sainsbury's blouses and overcoats. He comments on their meal, repeats this comment. They acknowledge his comment by repeating it back to each other. Then they laugh, but Jaunty doesn't share the chuckle they have invited him to join them in. Instead, he blinks back at the menu, then at the sales assistant, a young girl with a rash of pimples on her face. He orders chicken McNuggets in preference to the Egg McMuffin, even though eggs are meant to be for breakfast and chicken is more of a lunch or dinner thing. Jaunty thinks that this answers the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? The egg, as it's breakfasty. But if so, has he broken some kind of law made by God? The quandary gnaws at him as he takes the proffered food to a free seat. He covers just one McNugget in ketchup, the Hearts McNugget, which he will eat last. Go away, Rangers. Go away, Aberdeen. Go away, Celtic. Go away, Killy. Most of all, go away, Hibs. Jaunty, jaunty chants under his breath as he chews on the nuggets, swiftly swallowing them down one by one. He worries that people might think the sole red one signifies Aberdeen instead of Hearts. It's no Aberdeen, he says to the Sainsbury's women, waving the nugget on his fork. And we get this, which I enjoy, because I, I read this just, just after Christmas as well. Jaunty doesn't care about them. He goes up to the jukebox. There are some Barry Barry Christmas songs on the jukebox. He likes that one he calls I Will Stop the Calvary and believes it's about going to Canada. He thinks going to Canada would be great, but very cold. And we get this recurring theme of the persecution of Scotland smokers by forcing them to go and stand outside during ball bag. So uh, to calm himself, he picks up the free newspaper and reads slowly. Scotland smokers have been braised for their heroism, standing up to extremely inhospitable elements in the form of the devastating hurricane known dismissively as Borbag by the locals. As the storm raged to its height around 1am, clusters of smokers spontaneously left the bars of Edinburgh's grass market, where they struck up a rousing defiant rendition of Flower of Scotland. But instead of standing against proud Edward's army, as in Roy Williamson's famed lyric, they substituted this with Hurricane Borbag. I'm not sure if that typo is deliberate or not. Plasterer Hugh Middleton, 58, said, I've never seen anything like it. We just roared our song out into the night. 
Amazingly, the hurricane seemed to die out after that, so we really did send Borbag homewards to think again. I suppose the message is that if you come to Scotland, behave yourself and you'll be looked after, but if you step out of line... Politicians have been quick to heap praise on the courageous puffers. Local MSP George McAlpine said, Scotland smokers have had a rough time of it lately, but they showed great fortitude and inspirational courage. And we get another update from the newspaper people. It's fair to say that life post Borbag will never be the same. The lessons of Borbag were that Scots, once again, realised that they were back at the centre of the world, which would look to us to provide the appropriate behavioural response to this sort of natural calamity, though within the context of a strong free Britain, and with a powerful military presence to assist our American allies in their selfless quest in maintaining peace throughout the globe. And then John T goes to do confession, so we get here. John T walks into the Roman Catholic Church, looks in awe at the statues of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. He wonders who has more money, the Pope or the Queen? the feudal Roman Catholic Church or the British monarchy and aristocracy, speculates whether, as a painter and decorator, it is better to be a Catholic or a Protestant. He's scared at first. Real Dad Henry used to say to him as a kid, Dene go in there or the funny fellies in the frocks will get a hood of you. But it was very posh, not like the old Kirk in Pennyquick with the Reverend Alfred Bertels, the minister with the hair growing out of his nose, who had a strange dampish smell that John T always associates with church. And then the priest kind of is like, well, you can't, he says, um, you don't understand, you can't simply pick and choose a particular article of a faith that happens to interest you. A church isn't like a supermarket. John T considers Tesco, Sainsbury's and Morrison's. How some things were better when you bought them from different shops. Maybe it should be, but that would be awfully good, sir, see, if you could just pick out the best bits of each religion. If you didn't have to go to the church at all, unless it was for weddings and funerals like us proddies, and you could get confession for your sins like use paint, and then dress up the lassies like they Muslims day so that other men couldn't look at them. Because that's the problem, father, that's what I want to talk about, when other laddies look at your lassie. I really think you should leave. But we're all God creatures. Please leave before I call the police, the priest says, and John T can hear him rising. Ah, oh, sir, no need for that, sir. I'm going, sir. And John T gets up, but then he, but when he moves aside, he's confronted by a younger man than he'd assumed, a cub priest. John T is shocked. This sort of man could get a girlfriend if he wanted. He doesn't really need to bother with children. That's me away, then. And uh, Juice Terry's having some sex, and he, he also uh, does porn films as well, so from his point of view. Um, we got, She locks her arms around and grabs his curly mane, and they stumble to the bed. It's a wild and intense session, of the sort that makes Terry yearn for the appearance of a couple of video cameras and an overhead boom mic, and even the cajoling bossy presence of Sick Boy, his face set stoically, holding a clipboard. It would be a price worth paying to have this one down on tape. And then we get this conversation between Terry and Sarah Ann, who he calls Suicide Sal. Help yourself. Sarah Ann reclines on the bed, watching Terry push back his corkscrew coals, his gaze burning into the screen. What about you? You ever been with another guy? It's just no my thing. Then he got us wrong, I've tried, Terry says, then looks up from the screen. I thought, there's got to be something in this, so I tried to ram this boy one night. But I just saw that hairy ass crack, an old faithful here, he pats his cock, experiencing a satisfying twinge. Just wasn't he feeling it, and I can get it up like that, he snaps his fingers. Well, a fucking adult film actor, you've got to, but I... Then I thought it was because the boy was a bit butch, so I got a hood of this wee thranny one night. Tell you, plenty birds are bang, no you likes. I've been a lot rougher looking than this boy. Shaved ass crack between peachy wee cheeks. So I thought, here we go, Terry explains. Then his eyes fell back onto the screen. And he says, aye, in an ideal world, every other laddie would be celibate and I'd be bisexual. Increase the pool of opportunities. But now, nah, I've had to come to terms with my heterosexuality. And Sarah Ann sits cross-legged on the bed and pushes her hair back. What about if somebody tried to fuck you? No, with these fucking Duke uh, guys. My eyes water just thinking about it. I thought you tensed up when I tried to, you know, with my finger. Too right, with they nails you got? I'd be walking around all week with an evening news stuffed up my hole to try and stench the bleeding. So here we have a, a chapter from Terry's point of view, Instruments of the Devil. Yeah, cunt, that was some session doing the taxi club last night. Some cunts say the taxi club isn't what it once was, and it isn't it, but it's still one of the cheapest pints in tune, and that has to count for something. Suicide Sal got pished as fuck, but, and she was angling to get back to mine. Our body swerved at you, and she passed out, so I took her back out to Joppa. On the way there, she fucking woke up and told us to pull over somewhere, already pulling her clothes off. Fuck's sakes, I found the spot and banged her back to sleep, but it was some graft. A total gore and a tidy ride, but that shaved ninja ears needs either another fucking trim or to grow out a bit, because it nearly tore the fucking scrotum off us. Borsack like a fucking blown out tire on the motorway. But job done, she was fucking wasted after that ride and all the peeve. Had to carry her out of the curb and hood her up when I pressed the bell. 
the old girl came out and dragged her in. I could hear another shouting match going on, but that was me off ski. Up early this morning to get down to the sauna after stopping off for breakfast at this place on the walk that does good porridge. Complex carbs set you up for a day shagging. When a bird says, what's your fucking secret, Terry? I, I tell them, porridge. They think I'm joking, but I'm no best source of complex carbs, but I, let me get Terry here, he goes, I hangs up as my mate Johnny Catter phones, telling us some ketamine story that I can do without hearing, and I'm glad to get shot at a cunt. Drug tales are like dream tales and shagging tales, only interesting if they're your aim. I only watch porn to make a list of the lassies that I'd love to work with, which is basically them all, mind you. So here we get um, a conversation between Terry and um, Ronald, the American guy. You got all the organs in your body, liver, kidneys and all that. The function of the organs is to process all the shite you put into your cell, right? Yes. So if you're not giving them the occasion to be a shite and just putting puffy stuff through them, they're not getting tested. So they never build up to the level of resistance they need to be at. Think Scottish teams in Europe. Then some real disease hits you like Real Madrid style and they're useless. Because they never had serious game time. It's science mate, it's how the they tribes old school medicine men would go and take all sorts of poisons and walk into the forest or desert. They'd trip then spew and then shite like a squatty and come back all purged. And they cunts live donkey's years. Give the cunts a wee test. A rigorous training stint I call it. No going over the score but a wee workout likes. Ronnie's defo thinking about this. It starts tearing up that mohawk. You really believe that? That the occasional test is the best way of keeping your vital organs ticking over? Of course. Everything has a function. Let them get on with their fucking job. I'm not saying go over the score, but the odd we too isn't it gonna do you any harm. Damn it, Terry, I hadn't touched touch drugs since freshman year, before that ball bag came along. And now, you're a bad influence. Yes, he is. You've only just noticed. This bit just shit made me chuckle. I calls Big Liz fake control and has some phone sex with it. It's less risky than a real thing. When she sits on your coupon, they flaps her like Gestapo officers' gloves. So about as you know, then it's more the same with Suicide Sal. By the time I've shot off a second load, me knob's sore as fuck. Nearly pulled the fucking end off it. Good night's kit, but... So here we get this uh, little, bit, little bit from Juice Terry's point of view. He's met a ginger girl. His problemo, I'm fair taken by this ginger nut, but aye. She's got them freckles like some cunt just shot a white eye orange spunk all over her puss. Her hair's a bit short, but the point of being ginger is to let them fucking locks flow. This is for a lassie, obviously. For ginger headed laddies, the likes of the ginger bastard, you make sure the fucker's raised off of their scalp. But she's obsessed with my hair as I'm with hers. As we exit, she starts patting the locks. I like your hair. I feel the same about yours, I goes, as we gets out into the street. You just want to find out if the rug matches the curtain. And then he goes, You're gonna do all right here, I winks. This thong could take the crumbs out the bottom of a Pringles tube. And he finds out she works for the Royal Bank of Scotland and he goes, She was bound to be a raver working for the Royal Bank. After all, these cunts went and fucked everybody. And then, um, John T is having sex with Jin T. She's dead. It seems like she's close to him, but suddenly a stinging, icy rush grips his dick as he slides into her. It is not an altogether unfamiliar sensation. When Jinty came in and her hands were cold, she always used to say cold hands, warm heart, and she grabbed his cock. It was like a game they played. It was like that. She would say, sorry Jinty, my hands are really cold. And he would say, and he would tell her, it doesn't matter because my cock's still hot. But she is cold down there. The way you like it, but Jinty, the way you like it, but you have to wake up now. You have to wake up and move, Jinty grunts as he thrusts. This will wake her up. It was like Sleeping Beauty. If somebody could wake up through a kiss, how much more likely were they to do it with a ride? And Sting had done that. Sting had. Yes, he had. Johnny had seen it once on a play in the telly, which he'd only watched because Sting was on it. Sting had rode a lassie into life. Wake up, Jinty, wake up! He almost stops when a fly pops out of her open mouth. It spins around in the air slowly, then lands on her face, crawling over it before vanishing from his sight. They were like helicopters flies when they got tired. So Jonty grits his teeth and pumps. He will pump her back into life. But nothing is happening. He keeps thrusting. I did it with Karen, Jinty. I can it wasn't all right. But I was fit, Jinty. I was fit you'd never talk to us again. Talk to us well. But she's not talking to him. And then Jinty's dad has sex with Jonty and he feels bad so he lets him have sex with him because he's like, well I did just, I, you know, his daughter's dead. And then Sally Ann, or whatever her name is, Suicide Sal. Um, Sarah Ann, I think her name is. She has a play coming out called A Decent Ride with a character in it. It's suspiciously like Terry. And then Terry, we have Terry, it's from Terry's point of view here, and we have her standing up ahead, his back to the wall, is wee Jonty Mackay. 
He has his eyes shut and palms outstretched, touching his cold painted surface. It looks like he is meditating. It's been a while since Terry has seen Jaunty up here. Jaunty, what are you doing? Jaunty's eyelids snap open. Hi Terry, hi pal. I was just imagining that I was getting shot by a firing squad, Terry. I sure, a firing squad. Like they were going to pull the trigger any minute. Because it's a shame for people to get shot by firing squads. And I wanted to see what it felt like, I sir, to see what it felt like. It's, apparently he's Irish. And then Terry realises that he, basically if he has sex again he's going to die. And he says, a lifetime of impotence, resentment, anger and frustration. No fucking exuberance in life. Forced to become an internet troll or a miserable drunk in the boozer. And he finds out that his old mate Post Alec is his real dad. And that's significant because of this paragraph. Well, she's still not happy, but we finish our tea in a strange civility. Across at the next table, there's a couple of muck buckets, but they're sitting up near root, even in the medicated old faithful. I'm glad to get away, but who'd say this is bad? In fact, now that the better weather's kicked in, it's fucking torture. The tune's full of fanny. I love to try and think about the likes of Doughhead or Blakesy sucking my tadger just to stave off the erection, even with their useless fucking pills. To think that when I was with a bird and getting excited, I used to think about a gam for my old Red Coop and mate Post Alec. They hid back the moment. But that's well fucked up now. Yeah, cunt. Freud would be able to fucking weld a tire with me on his. So basically, when he was having sex with a girl and he wasn't ready to come, he would think of his friend Post Alec giving him a blowjob. But it turns out Post Alec is actually his dad. And then he goes to see his dad who is dying in the hospital. And he hates, well, his, his dad, not his real dad. And he hates the bastard. And he goes, um, I'm looking at the saline drop on the hook. Before I came, what I'm really doing, I'm pulling the curtains around the bed. I unhooks the bag and I've got my knife out and I'm cutting a hole in the top. Then I pull out three quarters of the saline into the sink. I get to my knob out and pishes into the bag, filling it up, feeling it booed you all warm in my hands. It fills and some pish spills over my fingers. I have to limp to the sink to get rid of the rest, then clean up the mess with paper towels. So Terry starts reading Moby Dick and he goes, uh, Moby Dick was about this cunt chasing a whale, right? I see myself as that boy, only instead of being obsessed with a whale, we, with me it's Fanny, and the taxi's like my boat. So instead of Captain Ahab, you can call me Captain Ahab. So yeah, all in all, I did enjoy this book. I'm a big Irving Welsh fan in general, and I just think this was probably one of his better ones. You probably will want to read the other uh, Juice Terry books before this one, but if you've been keeping up with his, his releases, definitely grab this one as well. Overall, I gave it a 4.5 out of 5, and it's a pretty solid contender for one of my books of the quarter. So there we have it, that's what I made of a decent ride by Irvin Welsh. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon with another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.